All right. All right, I think we're gonna get started and, and folks can trickle in. Um, all right, so thank you everyone. Uh, welcome to our virtual panel on machine learning and the satellite revolution. How democratizing AI for disaster response can build local to global climate resilience. My name is Emilina Glinskis, and I am the Global Program Manager at Cloud Street, where I oversee user partnerships and the deployment of Cloud Street's disaster analytics tools for our stakeholders globally in the humanitarian space, uh, which includes disaster managers, national governments, NGOs, and, and regional development banks. I'm very excited today to chat about how recent Sorry, I think that was muted for a second. <laughs> um, I am excited today to chat about how recent innovations in AI um, technology is dealing with our greatest global climate crisis, as well as how we can directly apply this technology barrier free to the everyday lives of practitioners on the ground. Personally, I'm uh, very excited as a user facing professional. Um, this piece is important to me and I hope for all researchers working in this technical space. So we'll be hearing from our great partners at NASA Servier, Radiant Earth Foundation, and our very own co-founder at Clatcher Street today. So I first want to thank you all for coming to this exciting panel. So first, I'd like to lay out a few small logistics before we dive in. Um, after introduction, the three panelists will present case studies around AI successes and relevance for increasing local resilience to climate change for about seven minutes apiece. And throughout the presentations at any time, please utilize the Q&A feature um, on Zoom to submit questions for the end discussion, which will take about uh, 20 minutes. So we'll first er internally open up the discussion um, after the third presenter moderated by myself. And then we'll spend the last 15 to 20 minutes on audience questions. So again, submit them anytime throughout this webinar and there will be an opportunity to upvote questions by audience members. So we'll choose questions in the order of those upvotes. And please just individually message me or my colleague, Maddie Ryan, who's helping with this panel if anyone has any issues. So with that, we can begin. So first, I just wanna set a bit context about why we are discussing this topic today. Climate change, as many of us know, is undoubtedly the largest threat to our planet and society at large. And specifically, disasters like flooding are increasingly um, getting worse to warmer temperatures, creating stronger storms and higher sea level uh, sea levels, making flooding the disaster that affects more people than any other hazard globally. And in the realm of agriculture, almost half of our land is dedicated to cultivating food, and farmers will be on the front lines of climate change, facing huge threats to their livelihoods by extreme weather changes. And this seriously affects global food security. Already one in nine people are starving, and this figure may only worsen as food supplies are threatened while the world seeks to feed nine billion people by 2050. So these are all very hard topics, but each of our speakers today will touch on some of these environmental issues. And on the other side of accelerating change, on this other extreme, we're seeing a massive growth in the AI industry globally. Last year alone, AI companies attracted nearly 40 billion globally in disclosed investment. And a lot of this interest is housed in the private sector geared towards innovations like facial recognition, self-driving cars, and other profitable avenues you've probably already heard about in the media. And satellite technologies are also radically entering a new era. There are more than 150 Earth observation satellites currently in orbit, and this number only grows by the year. So the main question of this panel is, how can we leverage this financial interest and golden era in academic research in machine learning and Earth observation data towards actual climate resilience on the ground? And how can these ideas make it to the front lines of those feeling climate change's greatest effects at home today? And so these are some of the themes that we'll be discussing in the next hour. So first, I'd love to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Beth Tellman is the chief scientist and co-founder at Cloud Street, where she oversees the science team's efforts to map flood exposure, risk, and social vulnerability. Tim Mayer is the Hindu Kush Himalaya Regional Science Coordination Lead at NASA Servier. Tim's research is focused on machine learning applications of remote sensing, focusing on landscape ecology, and land cover land use analysis. And finally, Dr. Hamed Ali Mohammed is the Executive Director and Chief Data Scientist at the Radiant Earth Foundation. He leads the organization's machine learning efforts on developing open source tools, models, and training data sets for tools to monitor their progress towards sustainable development goals. Thank you all for joining us today. 
So first, we'll dive in um, and we'll hear from Dr. Hamed from Radiant Earth about how machine learning can enable global climate analytics and how to best confront training data challenges for diverse geographical systems. Thanks so much, Dr. Mahed. Thank you, Molina. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, uh, very excited to be in this panel with our colleagues. And um, I'm going to talk about particularly the training data piece of this big puzzle that we are talking today, the AI ML and the climate resilience in itself is a, is a huge puzzle, but one piece of it, which is the core mission of Radian on better and uh, kind of openly accessible geospatial training data sets uh, to be helping basically communities build better applications and models. Uh, but before that, uh, I wanna just spend a minute or so talking about who we are, what is Radian. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, Radiant is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are based in US, but we primarily focus on uh, uh, empowering what we call organizations and individuals who are the last mile of this kind of uh, ecosystem uh, with training data sets, standards, and tools to can better use machine learning uh, kind of techniques on satellite imagery and address world's uh, most critical challenges. We just heard about uh, issues with the increasing uh, flooding impacts, uh, food security problems, all of those international challenges. And with the increasing availability of satellite data, how can we better use this? So we try to be a community builder and enabler within this ecosystem. Uh, next, please. Uh, so yeah, when you think about the kind of analytics generally with satellite imagery, so you have the satellite data, many of them openly accessible from government agencies like NASA, ESA, JAXA, and other uh, global uh, organizations, and the commercials that are growingly becoming more accessible. Um, and then there is the machine learning advancements in the uh, computer vision field that now kind of penetrating all the other domains. Uh, and then there is the training data. These are the three pieces that need to come together so you can build a better model, a better application, and then derive analytics, whether it's about uh, monitoring crop productivity, whether it's looking at the flood mapping, uh, land cover change, uh, all of those need these three pieces that are very specific to that. The satellite data is becoming more and more available. Uh, machine learning advancements are happening, but the missing piece in there, which needs a kind of, uh, I would say surgical investment is the training data puzzle. Um, and the issue with the training data is, if you go to the next slide, uh, you need to have a very uh, kind of diverse and benchmark training data for various applications that you think about. Uh, but for example, agriculture, you see in this, in this picture, various types of uh, fields across the globe, uh, from US, Europe, Africa, uh, South America to East Asia. Uh, they have different scales, former practices are different, um, soil is different, climate is different. So all of these diversity needs to be built into your training data set. Uh, and the situation now, the challenge is there's lack of geodiversity in the data. So we want to build a model, we don't have enough data. Uh, in many cases, there is a scarcity of data sources. We don't have enough data on the ground to build this training data, so we need to actually go and collect data. Um, one more issue is whenever the data is available, it is not accessible, meaning that a new user who is coming to the community cannot easily find the data and consume it. Uh, interoperability, how we store our data, what is the format, how we share it with others uh, still needs to be addressed again as a community problem. And lastly, the ML readiness of the data. Not everybody is a geospatial expert, right? Uh, people want to build a machine learning model. They don't need to know about, oh, what is the projection of this thing? How can I convert that? Installing GDAL and all of those kind of bolts and nuts that we can talk about. So making the data more easily accessible, benchmark and well-documented is basically the challenge and what is what we are trying to address in this ecosystem to make sure our models are not biased, the results are uh, basically reliable, and they're transparent, so the end user can uh, trust uh, the, the predictions from the model. To address this, what Radian has done, uh, the next slide please, it is what we call an ML Commons for Earth Observation. Uh, so it is a hub, we call it Radiant ML Hub, uh, which has training data sets openly accessible to everyone. Uh, we are gonna soon add a, kind of a repository for models. So if there is an open model, you can easily find that in a harmonized and a standard format that everybody can use. Uh, we work on other aspects of this ecosystem. Uh, we'll 
briefly mention uh, the community aspect because this is not just about open data. We need to have a community, share best practices, develop uh, kind of guidelines and standards so we can better work on these. And also technical working groups that can kind of tackle specific issues within the community, as well as education, uh, uh, running training programs, uh, market uh, information, and kind of uh, uh, speaking engagements like today that we are talking to you. So this is basically the portfolio of Radiant ML Hub to address the issue that I talked about. Uh, we currently have uh, various data sets hosted. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in various domains that you can think about. Uh, I mean, with crops, we have like a training data set specific to crop types in various countries. Uh, I should just highlight that the, the white ones are the ones that are already available. The gray ones will be soon added. Uh, they are in the pipeline of being uh, basically added to our data catalog. Uh, you can think about land cover, again, adding to the existing diversity of those. Um, some of these data, and I would say, honestly, majority of them are coming from the community. So it's not just us developing the data. We are building that library that you can easily uh, share your data and then others can use it and cite it and then you see how your data is being uh, basically applied. So various applications, we have tropical storms coming up. Uh, we have a surface water actually from the cloud to, cloud to street team, which will be hosted soon on our platform. And all of these is basically growing a repository, a library of these data sets for uh, a better uh, benchmark uh, data sets available to everyone. I wanna pick on one of those which relates to the climate resiliency topic we talk, if we go to the next slide, and that is about land cover classification. Um, land cover is probably one of the fields that has been uh, kind of monitored using satellite imagery for many years. Uh, but the issue has been a lack of kind of accessibility to a very geographically diverse training data. Many of the existing data sets in the land cover domain are focused in the developed world, uh, many of them particularly in Europe and US. So we targeted this problem as a key issue, identifying that as an outcome of an expert workshop that we have said, that we need to develop a better training data set for land cover classification. Uh, so the data set is using uh, a satellite uh, uh, system called Sentinel-2, a uh, mission by European Space Agency. You see a sample image of that from, uh, from Nigeria. And the data set is at 10 meter resolution, uses temporal data. And then we went after basically a very uh, high quality sampling, where should we sample the data to make sure it has a representative kind of distribution. Uh, and generated that using a kind of a human uh, verification system. If we go to the next slide, we can see some samples of that data. Uh, so these are examples of that chips of imagery, uh, 256 by 256, overlaid with the Sentinel-2. You can see various uh, types of kind of water, uh, croplands, urban areas, uh, grasslands. Uh, this is basically the first globally geographically diverse training data set for land cover classification. It's called Land Cover Net. Uh, you can look it up at landcover.net. Uh, we have released the Africa part of this for the first version, which includes about 130 million pixels labeled. Uh, and it has seven classes. Uh, so more details of that is available on the website if you're interested. But we are basically releasing that and working with the communities who are working the land cover mapping so we can have a better system to do land cover land use change monitoring uh, for better climate resiliency. Uh, and with that, yeah, I would like to thank you uh, and our contacts in the last slide. If you have any questions, I uh, will be here, but uh, after the panel, I will be happy to be in touch as well. Thanks so much, Dr. Hamed. All right, um, next we will hear from our very own Dr. Beth Tellman on recent papers published by Cloud to Street that utilize machine learning approaches to improve, uh, improve global flood mapping beyond traditional remote sensing. Thanks so much, Beth. Awesome, thanks, Melina. Um, so Cloud to Street, if you're not familiar with who we are or what we do, is a public benefit corporation that provides near real-time flood risk analytics and dashboards to users. Um, Emelina actually leads the, the work of figuring out what users need, what are their decisions that have to be made. And then as the science team, we try to figure out what's the right remote sensing analytics and what kind of maps do they need to make that decision and, and assess its accuracy. We work with a variety of partners uh, from the World Food Program to insurance companies and uh, deliver that information. Um, I'm not gonna focus on kind of all of our, our outputs of that and how that works in the real world, but we can talk about that more in the discussion. Um, the way that our platform works, next slide, uh, is we analyze uh, every satellite that we can 
that is in the cloud, make the best flood map possible from it, fuse satellites together when possible to get the best flood prediction, and then uh, communicate that information to users in the way that they need it. So that might be distilled information on crops or roads affected or the number of people affected highlighting specific areas. Uh, we're also working more and I'll show you in one of our papers on thinking about how do we not just gener use photos and information people on the ground have about floods but use that to feed back into our model prediction. So it's an iterative, iterative process from the cloud to the street and then back to the models that we have running in the cloud. That's our vision. Next slide. Um, so I'm just going to share uh, a couple of insights from our three most recent machine learning papers. Um, and you can check out these papers to read more about them and the data that we've released with some of these papers. So I want to talk about some of our first experiments using convolutional neural nets for flood mapping, how to integrate uh, crowdsource information into convolutional neural nets. And then at the end, I'll talk about um, using GANs to simulate SWIR bands and generate more automatically, um, more automatic labels, uh, since GANs are like a really data heavy kind of supervised uh, classification, you need more data. So I'll talk about that approach at the end. Okay, first experiment. Um, next slide. Um, so you can download the data that we use to produce this paper. It's called Sen1 Floods 11. It will be in Radiant Earth ML Hub hopefully soon. We're finishing some of the final stack formatting to make it usable for a larger community. But this data set is paired Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 overpasses for 11 floods. And we also have hand-labeled data that you can use uh, to test your model predictions. The main insight that we found from these experiments is that if you want to use a convolutional neural net to predict floods, train it on floods. You're not going to get as good of results if you just train it on uh, permanent water. Floods are different enough that you've got to train it on that specific type of water. The second insight is that if you don't have enough hand labeled points, Use weekly, use weak labels. Use a simple classification from another sensor if you have coincident overpasses. And you and you're gonna get much better model results if you can just ramp up the amount of labels that you have, and it's gonna make your model much better. Um, next slide. And it's it seen as massively outperformed kind of traditional remote sensing algorithms, but uh, that's a sort of obvious point I think we're finding in almost every sector of remote sensing right now. The second is, um, if you have these crowdsource points, how do you use it to update a CNN? And we're presenting this at the NeurIPS Climate AI Workshop, I think next week, Veda Sankar is our lead engineer on that paper. Uh, but what this experiment shows is if you have a trained data collector, so say you have people um, that you've pre-trained to collect flood information in different parts of the city, and you use their flood observations to re-update uh, the supervised information in your convolutional neural net versus just scraping information from social media, say, of people who have taken flood photos around the city, which one of those types of crowdsourced impacts is in, uh, inputs is going to give you a better model? And is there actually a difference? That's the main question uh, that Veda asks in this paper. Next slide. What we found is that it doesn't make a massive difference. The difference is you need some kind of crowdsource data. So whether you're going to use kind of dispersed uh, trained collectors around the city, you're going to get a little more accuracy than if you would just potentially scrape social media, which is probably going to be concentrated in points of high population. The real message here is that even if you just have 20 to 50 ground points, which is a tiny amount of data when you think about machine learning, we were finding that you get three to five uh, percent increases in accuracy. So crowd data can give you unique information that you can't get um, from a satellite and it's really worth investing uh, in this option. Next slide. Okay, the last experiment that I wanna show um, is uh, working with uh, GANs, general adversarial networks, uh, which tend to be more data hungry than a convolutional neural network uh, type of machine learning. You need even more labels typically uh, to make these, these work. Next slide. What we wanted to do here 
um, is try to first synthesize a shortwave infrared band on planet data. If you're familiar with water and flood mapping, you probably already know that it's the shortwave infrared band on optical sensors like Sentinel-2 and Landsat that really make the difference in identifying water from other objects. But unfortunately, in high spatial resolution sensors like planet, drones, we usually do not have shortwave infrared wavelengths on those smaller satellites. So is there a way that we can synthesize a shortwave infrared band by training the smaller satellites to, to produce it if you can train it on the coarser satellites like Sentinel-2 that do have shortwave infrared band? So that's one of the first things that we used a general adversarial network to do, and we got pretty, um, we got pretty good results. Second, if you're able to do this successfully, and you can read the paper for more of these details, what you then can do is generate a lot more labeled points that you can use to train a convolutional neural network or another sort of AI segmentation network and get better results in flood uh, segmentation. So that's what this paper takes on, and I'll show you what those results look like. All right, so what you're seeing on the left here is the input image. This is images from Planet Scope. Uh, then you have sort of the ground truth. This is our hand labeling of uh, these Planet Scope images. These are the same flood events that we used in Sun 1 Floods 11. We just found the planet overlap uh, for these. UNET is a type of CNN, and that's kind of our uh, initial, initial output. You can see not doing an amazing job. In the middle, you then have the synthesized sphere band. This is kind of what we generated uh, on Planet Scope, trained on Sentinel-2. And then if you just try to threshold it, that's uh, the next column. And then our network, uh, H2O-Net, where you sort of take both generating more labels from the synthetic sphere band and updating the CNN, um, you get a much better result. So the end on the right is sort of our best prediction from, from the network we developed in this paper called H2O-Net. Next slide. Uh, what this actually looks like in numbers um, is that adding in the synthetic sphere band and increasing our labels increased accuracy from 10 by 10 to 15 percent on both planet scope and uh, drone data. And the important thing to note here is Yes, using a refiner network to get more labels does increase accuracy three to 5%, but it's really this sort of synthetic sphere that was doing most of the work here in this accuracy gain. Um, well, next slide. This is uh, the last, um, is the questions that we think uh, the community should be assessing now going forward and that we're interested in are, how do you validate accuracy and consistency over time and space for things that our users care about using these types of machine learning models once they're running in near real time? Can we do even more work like this synthetic SWIR using a GAN to come up with new bands when we think we don't have enough data? And, and I'm really interested in kind of this work to systematically include include crowd data, not just as a way to validate our models, but as inputs to them. And can we move beyond just what we did in VEDA's uh, Sinkar's experiment, which is take a crowdsourced uh, point and use it as a point, but what about all the information in that photo? Could we segment water out of the picture that someone took, superimpose it on the ground, and get a ton more spatial information uh, to retrain a CNN? Um, so that's what we're excited about doing going forward. Um, and get in touch if you'd like to hear um, more about our research. Check out um, our papers. We'll be at AGU over these next two weeks. I think we have something like 20, 20 different presentations. We'll be in Hamid's session um, about uh, machine learning um, and automated label refinement, for example. Um, and look for, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Beth. All right. Moving along, um, we'll finally hear from Tim Mayer from NASA Severe about their surface planning toolkit for floods in the lower Mekong and how this work was developed, scoped, and utilized in collaboration with groups that include Google as well as local research communities. Thanks so much, Tim. Great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm Tim Mayer, the Severe Regional Science Coordination Lead for the Hindu Kush Himalayan Hub. And I'm really pleased to be part of this discussion and you know, be a representative for Severe here. So next slide. And as we know, you know, the main focus of our discussion today really centers around the practical use of Earth observation, as well as 
machine learning approaches to build climate resiliency within communities. And with my brief amount of time for my presentation, I wanted to highlight Severe's model to, and provide a few, just a few brief snapshots of some services to help kickstart the discussion. So overall, Severe is a joint initiative between NASA and the U.S. Agency for International Development. And we currently have activities in more than 50 countries and we collaborate with more than 250 institutions. So um, we specifically have five hubs across the entire globe. Um, and everyone on this, in, in this, in attendance here, fully is aware of the challenges associated with data scarcity uh, and the needed technical capacity to leverage Earth observation and geospatial technology. But Surveyor's approach is really to address these issues by building regional capacity at a global scale to promote collaboration, um, adoption of services and technology, and sustainability of efforts. Next slide. So we often use this image to really underscore Severe's approach. Our, our aim is to bridge the gap between the cutting edge science that's coming out of NASA and US-based institutions with end users' needs and their existing expertise. Next slide. And just really briefly, you know, Severe's focuses on four thematic areas, those being agriculture and food security, water and water-related disasters, land use and ecosystem, and weather and climate. I'm gonna just briefly touch on uh, a water and water related disaster later on in my slides. So next slide. And as I mentioned before, there are five regional hubs um, and really the expertise that comes out of Severe is from those hubs. There's two located in Africa. The first is in West Africa at Agrimet. The second is at Eastern Southern Africa at RCMRD in Kenya. There's the newest hub in Amazonia, which is located in Cali, Colombia at Siat. And then there's two hubs in Asia. The first is the Hindu Kush Malayan hub, which is located at Isimad. And then the second hub, which is the Mekong hub at the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center in Bangkok. I myself am from the Science Coordination Office at the Marshall Space Flight Center. But again, I want to stress that um, the strength of Severe is really through the vast network of individuals who serve the, their communities that comprise the region. So um, I'm only going to touch on one, one of the services. But if you're interested in any more of the services across these regions, definitely look at the Severe service catalog that provides more details of of the methodologies, as well as the end users. Uh, next slide. So I just wanted to, you know, sort of mention who Severe is, um, and really what that comes down to is collaboration is really the name of the game when it comes to identifying realistic solutions. Um, as you know, we already work with these regional hubs that are listed here as well, but we also have additional consortium members who provide um, expertise. And also we have great inter, uh, interactions with the private sector. And honestly, there isn't really enough time to sort of highlight the robust partnerships and collaboration uh, and dedication between these entities. So again, if you're interested by this, definitely feel free to reach out to me after this. Um, and next slide. And I wanted to also mention that, you know, NASA brings us cutting edge science over to the regional hubs. And that's through these collaborations with applied science team members. And currently we have 20 PIs actively co-developing thematically specific services. And again, this is working directly with the hubs to develop and refine technology and services. Next slide. And the power of how this regional collaboration is really uh, done is con and connecting these investigators from around the world is through the development of relevant services through the severe service planning toolkit. And here's a very highly, highly, highly simplified version of the approach, but essentially it's a cyclical process that is it's informed by the um, needs assessment that leads to the concept, the design, the co-development, and the delivery of the service to the eventual uh, specified end user. And this model is essential for ensuring the efforts, the approaches, the methodology, and the resources are really targeted to that specified need. And this that, may, that need may be something like uh, improving community level resiliency to landslides or flood inundations. So this framework is really the driving force to making the services relevant and sustainable. Next slide. So I wanted to just take the last few minutes that I have to uh, talk about one service from the myriad of services that we currently have, and that's the near real-time flood monitoring. Uh, next slide. And this is already, you know, I'm sure clear for everybody on the line, but, um, oh, next slide, please. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm sure everyone's aware of it. You know, the monsoonal rains and the tropical cyclones that are recurrent throughout Southeast Asia are a major issue. And there exists a direct need to monitor and disseminate information regarding inundated areas in near real time, allowing emergency response operations and support relief activities by both national and international organizations. And to meet this need for rapid flood monitoring and map production, Severe Mekong, the Science Coordination Office, the Spatial Informatics Group, SIG, Deltaris, 
Stockholm Environmental Institute, SEI, along with One Map Myanmar, and also at national levels with the Department of Disaster Management, Department of Hydrology and Meteorology, um, created the Hydrologic Remote Sensing Analysis of Floods tool, or the Hydro Floods tool. Uh, next slide, please. And the Hydro Floods tool really employs the most recently available optical, active and passive microwave remote sensing data from MODIS, Sphere, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Landsat, and that's to generate surface water maps, enabling more timely uh, and in-depth analysis to monitor flood events. And this system has a set of algorithms, including fusion techniques, which is really great to hear some of the other talks as well, uh, that advanced users can leverage. Uh, next slide. So sort of bringing this back home, you know, the Hydro Flood tool is, is a part of that overall near real-time flood monitoring service, and it's really sort of transitioning into that delivery stage of the toolkit now. And it's expanding into broader applications, including being utilized by the World Food Program for report generation, as well as being used in a pilot project by our consortium partners, Deltaras, to better understand road and infrastructure usage associated with flood events. So right now is really that most critical time where capacity building is being conducted to inform disaster managers on the methodologies and approaches, while also fine tuning the system to lead to more impact and decision making. Uh, next slide. And I know I'm coming up to the end, but I just wanted to hit this. Um, also in my closing section, um, Servier is, is really pushing the edge on some machine learning and AI, and all that work is coming out of the hubs. And that's through this Servier um, TensorFlow Working Group. Uh, next slide. And really this is a, a, co a collection of researchers who are not exclusively Servier folks, so anyone is welcome, but who are leveraging TensorFlow and more broadly a diversity of other ML and AI approaches to address issues such as mangrove mapping, um, gold mine detection, impervious surface, infrastructure, urbanization mapping, et cetera, et cetera. Really just the goal of TensorFlow Working Group is to create a, a community of practice, share methodologies and approaches, and work collaboratively to build, to build the capacity to employ uh, machine learning and AI. So certainly contact me if you are interested in this concept or want to join. Uh, I have two more slides. The next slide is just, again, I want to showcase the, the strength of Servier is really the network. Um, all the individuals who work every day to address the community, national, and regional level environmental concerns, um, those are the folks who are really pioneering a lot of this science. And next slide, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much uh, for letting me touch briefly on Servier. I definitely want to thank the uh, Science Coordination Office, the Servier Hubs, and the Applied Science teams who really make all the science possible. And definitely want to have a big thank you to Cloud to Street for uh, organizing this entire event. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. Um, these were all really enlightening uh, conversations. All right. I think here are some acknowledgments. I'll let people look at that for a second. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So now we're going to move along in the last sort of 20 minutes we have uh, for this panel to really have a deeper discussion, not only on sort of these amazing innovations that were discussed in all three of these talks, but also really the, the crux of the focus of this, which is around democratizing AI and what that actually means in the context of climate change and climate resilience. So I'll start off again, everyone who's here, uh, please feel free at this point to uh, continue to send us questions and we're going to get to them, but we'll start off with a few sort of internal discussion points. Um, I first want to dig in a little bit more on the topic of what it actually means to democratize AI in this realm. How do you and all your respective organizations ex assess the success of existing or new ML techniques in the context of the core missions of your respective organizations, whether it be to support livelihoods or general global sustainability? I'm super curious to hear your, your takes on this. Happy to go first. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the, one of the things we do, particularly with, with the democratization is, I mean, democratization is a very general term, but in our case, we look at it in terms of what people have access to and is it what they want? Because sometimes, for example, particularly in the, I would say the development nonprofit sector that we primarily work, the concept is, oh, this is the problem. Let's build something, let people use them. But that problem definition is coming from the developed world, not from the developing world, right? So you're not underground 
understanding the needs and the requirements of that problem or that user or that organization so that you go and develop the solution. So the main thing is, okay, first of all, sitting down, engaging the end user in the design of the problem, and then collaboratively and jointly build the solution, make them accessible to them. Uh, that, that's a core piece to, to not forget when we come to this space. The second piece is uh, the basically local people should build the local solution for the local problem. Uh, engaging them in all the steps of this ecosystem and let them be the innovators, the entrepreneurs. Uh, for example, with our mission, we are not the last mile organization. I mean, there are last mile organizations. I mean, I think uh, Cloud Street is one example of that. It's providing solutions on the ground. So we are, is working with the governments, with the stakeholders on the ground. We are not, but we work in a way to empower those organizations to be successful and build solutions for them. So the democratization is making the data in this case, training data, for example, openly accessible and discoverable to them, making it localized. Uh, we also recently launched an alliance with some other uh, partners in the ecosystem and uh, Open for Good Alliance, which is primarily focused on this issue of lack of diversity in the training data ecosystem. So to us, democratization is really engaging that end user in the whole portfolio of this end-to-end -end application from the design of the problem to the end solution um, and let them be part of this uh, solution building for their local problem. And Tim, you mentioned a bit about this as well with the needs assessment work that NASA Servier undergoes. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that and have users um, seen a difference in, in flood response process with the implementation of machine learning techniques in, this, in the lower Mekong region? Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I was nodding emphatically along with everything you might have been saying. It's just, um, you know, that that process of, you know, getting the end users engaged in every facet of the development, you know, with the concept, with the design, with the delivery, all the way through is, is crucial, absolutely crucial, because, um, you know, you're basically just throwing science over, over a wall at that point, except, you know, hoping that it, it lands, right? Um, but you know, I think with this approach that I mentioned before, it's, you know, getting them engaged, getting um, the end users really engaged in the whole process leads to better results. And, um, you know, I, that one figure I had is, again, is very highly simplified, but the needs assessment is really sort of the core part that really teases out what is the actual need. You know, someone might recommend that they need machine learning, but really they don't necessarily need machine learning. They need um, better flood maps and something like that already might exist and that resource doesn't need to be rebuilt for instance right but often you know you may need something else entirely so really scoping out what the need is is the first component but there is that necessary feedback that has to happen at each one of those phases where you after you develop something after you do the concept of it does it still uh, strike all the way through um, so I think you know that process is really the core to all the other services um, within Servier, um, but for like the hydro floods tool and also just the near real-time flood monitoring, um, it's definitely sort of in its infancy. It's, it's, as I mentioned before, it's really getting to that delivery stage, but um, I know that there's been ongoing engagement with the World Food Program, and there's an article that's coming out um, in the next couple, coming weeks, but really um, a lot of the things that they were highlighting is about the, the frequency of being able to engage with the humanitarian um, and government agencies um, not only is it just at a weekly scale, now they're on a daily scale, being able to provide more resources and sort of continue that conversation, which before was really sort of stymied by not being able to have uh, data on, on hand. So I think that's really filling a gap right now. Um, and the thing I'd like to echo is that, you know, there's a real latency associated with all these services. You know, it may take years for something to really be adopted by an institution and have real results. So you know, you always kind of have to have your ear to the ground to making sure that, you know, something that you developed four years ago and is starting to be adopted and starting to be employed and is now starting to get some results, you're still paying attention to that and feeding it back through that whole process to make sure that, um, you know, that's relevant information. Yeah, definitely. I think the iterative uh, process is key and, and it can, yeah, span quite a while with sort of institutional change. Um, I'm curious, it's very clear that machine learning has clear advantages over traditional remote sensing techniques, but I wonder if there are any unique challenges to implementing this um, on a scale that is really impactful, primarily around um, is data and labeling too cost prohibitive for governments and local communities we're trying to serve? 
Um, and then what about licensing and sharing this data and making it open? Are there unique challenges there as well? Yeah, so I'll, I can start from at least the, the water side. So when we think generally about, uh, I'm pretty new to machine learning science. I've been trained as a remote sensing scientist and as a geographer and have recently gotten into this field. But what's been impressive and interesting talking to, to other engineers, uh, Veda Sinkar wrote a medium post about this on our team, is that so much of the machine learning research um, and the labels available don't exist in the climate and environmental space. So a lot of the models that are built are related to, you know, images of cats on the internet or um, uh, like clothing items to optimize marketing or facial recognition technology for spine defense. So even the data sets and the models people are building are often not on the type of data that we need to be building models on in the climate space. So I think the access to labeled data to build good models and the work that, that Radiant Earth is doing to fill that gap is extremely important to make AI actually useful for climate change. And the gap is massive and we have so much work to do. Um, when we released Sun One Floods 11, I think it was one or two months after us, um, ESA released another labeled data set called, um, I think it's called Send 12 Flood. NASA is working on another labeled data set. So it's sort of starting to happen. And you're seeing organizations starting to build their own custom labeled data sets and in some cases contribute to Radiant Earth's um, machine learning hub. So hopefully we can start to aggregate more labeled data sets and maybe get to the scale of spy defense in the fashion industry and everyone else who has more data than frankly we do in our sector. But I think honestly, it's like, it's going to take more effort. Making these labeled data sets is massively uh, expensive. And so I am concerned about sort of the scale of the changing climate and the need for us to build AI machine learning models and the speed at which we're making labeled data. We've got to change that. So I'm interested to hear kind of uh, what Hamid thinks about that and the role Radiant Earth is playing there. Yeah, thank you, Beth. I think uh, you, 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 you stabbed at it very well. I mean, the, the problem is the, I mean, we just mentioned the ML and AI domain is really data hungry. Uh, it is way different than our traditional remote sensing uh, analysis that we would do like 10, 15 years ago. And the reason the AI field itself, the ML field has, has, has advanced, many of you know, is the kind of massive data sets that are coming through the social platforms like the social uh, networks basically and that has picked up in the imagery in the like language domain in many other domains so in our domain in the remote sensing in the geoscience world uh, and particularly with the climate applications we, we lack that kind of uh, massive data inputs we have the imagery coming in we have petabytes of imagery from satellites coming in but we don't have the target variable which would be the, the label basically to do that and I, I echo what Beth said and the problem is we cannot expect every single organization to go and generate their own specific training data set for a single application and then also build the model and the product and go to market and sell it to the end user that, that is too much for a startup to start with right and we should basically lower the barrier and that's one of the things we are on a mission to do make these data and first of all build a platform build an ecosystem that people can share data we need to have the infrastructure so that that's one thing then is the incentive and the basic mechanism to share the data uh, people should be incentivized to share the data whether you are a pi in a research or nonprofit organization a government civil servant or a commercial entity you should be incentivized not to just sell your product but to some extent share your data because it can benefit other. Why do you write paper, for example, because you wanna share your findings. The same way we should encourage people uh, to share their training data. But uh, one of the role we play is to also identify the gaps in this ecosystem and encourage funders to invest in there because many of these data sets are for public good. We need climate resiliency, we need better flood mapping, and there are a lot of uh, foundations, government agencies who are interested to basically support those missions. So. They need better understanding, okay, where is the data gap that we can support, whether through uh, solicitation and RFP or a grant funding from foundation. So we play that role uh, in terms of the policy and the kind of decision making. But the more data we can share as a community, everyone will be uh, basically the winner. It's a win-win situation for everyone. Uh, so I, we, uh, basically my message to everyone is, 
plan for sharing your data, particularly when you start the project. Uh, because if you want to wait until the end of the whole thing is done and then say, okay, I will share my data when everything is done. All your resources are gone at that time. If you haven't documented your data well, if you haven't uh, kind of formatted accordingly, you don't have enough resources. The team is probably gone. The graduate student is uh, defended and he, he or she is away. Uh, you don't have the resources to share. So plan in advance, work on your own application, and when you're ready, uh, share your data. And we are happy to host the data on, on ML Hub as well. Great. Um, I'm going to now move to sort of the audience questions here, starting with the, the one with the most upvotes here. Um, so one of the challenges of data revolution and the influx of data sharing and presenting is the way that it's impactful or useful for the end user. Um, so how have you guys adapted specifically sharing science and data to make it usable for your users? Um, and I guess that touches upon, we just spoke about kind of opening up training label data and actually making it available to the whole community, but specifically users as well. I'm curious if you guys have thoughts on this. I can, I can go first and probably Tim or Beth can go next. So I think one of the things is uh, to make sure that data is impactful and useful is have a standard way of sharing the data and the documentation. So the data is not just about, oh, there are some files that are out there, right? There was a paper a couple of years ago in the Nature called Open is Not Enough. So just putting a zipped folder on your website, say, oh, I shared my data, that doesn't work. Uh, you need the support with that. The support is a documentation, a human readable documentation and a machine readable metadata, as well as if there are specific software to read the data and use the data. Uh, it can be as simple as a Jupyter notebook to read the data, or it can be a more complex Python package if the data is more complex. So you need to have all of those resources with the data shared. And then the next thing is, talking to the end user. So this is an iterative process. It is not a one-time thing. So when we share data, when we have the API, for example, on our side, we ask feedback from the users. How are you using the data? How you wanna see it change in future? Uh, and because we have an API-based design, everything is modular so we can change things in future. Uh, it is not just a one thing that is very kind of solid written in stone and we can't change it. It's too much effort to do it. So being agile in the development, thinking about the end user, getting their feedback, and having those kind of ecosystems of documentation, metadata, and software as needed are, are the key aspects of a successful data sharing. Yeah, I would also hop in and say, you know, I think there's so, there's so many challenges associated with working in uh, developing countries as well. You know, with um, compute and uh, bandwidth, those are other issues that are you know just really persistent and sort of part of the landscape that you have to, um, you know, make, make judgment calls around. And, um, you know, one of the main driving forces is really keeping all of our code base really open and accessible. So that way as other hubs, for instance, within Severe, um, hear about a, say like a, a flood monitoring system, they can take that and adapt it for their data and, you know, maybe leveraging some of the, the training data that is now now available, right? So um, I think that's one of the big factors, not only from say a, um, a training data standpoint, this is also the technological component of, um, you know, you have to have open software that folks can utilize with maybe outdated computers or um, limited bandwidth as well. So you have to sort of build that as a component into the larger context of making sure that your data is actually accessible beyond just saying it's accessible. Um, you have to make sure that anyone can use it, especially people who are going to be hopefully using it to solve a problem at the very final miles, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I know at Codger Street, we found that sometimes you really just have to put yourself in the shoes of people who are sort of most decentralized from the decision-making process and understand what are their modes of communication, what are their technical limitations and data limitations, and even thinking about how to translate some of these really sophisticated insights to a simple WhatsApp message could actually make all the difference um, for folks on the ground. So sometimes you really do have to kind of think outside the box and realize that um, these insights uh, can be delivered in a variety of ways that um, actually create quite the difference on the ground. Um, great, so uh, I'll do one final question here as we wrap it up. Um, an upvoted question here is that 
uh, what do you, where do you think the research field should focus their efforts next? What are the biggest gaps between research and effective tools that still exist? I can go first, but I, I kind of touch on this in my presentation a little bit. And I also kind of want to touch on the last uh, question you asked, Emelina. First on, um, we have had a really big problem in deploying um, published pa papers from algorithms and the accuracy assessment that they report, and then trying to actually make a system work in near real time with the user for looking at how well that flood algorithm works on their schools, roads, crops, et cetera, and their specific region. And we often find that it's not transferable. I see Tim nodding his head, so maybe y'all have had the, a similar experience. So then we have to go through this crazy process of reinventing what an accuracy algorithm metric actually would look like if you were a user that was using this data having to come up with new metrics and then test it over time. So I think the general message here is that the way that we test uh, I, not just remote sensing algorithms, but I also think machine learning algorithms, simple IOU metrics on a segmentation model for a couple of events, even dozens of events is not enough to actually uh, uh, look at the generalizability of that model in a real world use context. The number one thing I think is thinking about time. So uh, for flooding specifically, to how well does your algorithm perform, you know, throughout the course of a flood event when you're doing water segmentation? And can you get la labeled data throughout time? Can you make sure you're getting labeled data and looking not just at general IOU metrics and how good is a flood map on average, but how good was it at predicting a school being flooded versus roads versus specific type of crop? So you can communicate to your user, you know, Flooded vegetation is a problem in this algorithm, and we think we've underpredicted uh, flood impacts in your cornfields, for example. So thinking more about how we sample in terms of what people care about and sampling over time for accuracy is kind of one of the most important things I think uh, that this field needs to work on specifically for disaster applications. And I think the second one, this is also, maybe it's more of a social science research agenda, but I don't think we're very good at really assessing the impact of, of remote sensing and machine learning specifically on the ground. And there's probably a lot that we can learn from um, JPAL, um, other organizations, Esther Duflo won the Nobel Prize last year for impact assessment and development. Um, so there's a lot that we can take from those other sectors and getting serious about what is machine learning doing really? How do we track specific decisions and look at impact intervention in a more quantitative way? Um, so that I think is a really important area of research and collaborations that we need to be doing with social scientists to make sure that this actually gets used and has an impact because it's not just about proving to ourselves that machine learning matters. It actually should be how we think about redesigning what we make and what our algorithms um, are studying. At Cloud Street, we talk about, you know, the, it's not a last mile problem. It's actually the first thousand miles that you should be running when you're designing. And it's also another thousand miles at the end when you learn, oh gosh, people maybe don't always just make decisions based off squinting on a flood map in a dashboard. They're making decisions off other information that you're aggregating. Um, you kind of saw Tim's, um, the way Servier is doing this, looking at number of roads impacted uh, crop crops, number of people, et cetera, or what we do kind of sending out to WhatsApp groups. You got to figure out what's that packaging actually look like after you make your segmentation map from machine learning um, that makes a difference. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, there are a few lingering questions here. I think some of them our panelists can answer uh, via the text box uh, for some kind of more specific questions. Um, but otherwise, I'd like to wrap up this panel um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, this session will be recorded and we did get a request to send some of the materials, so but we're happy to do so um, once this concludes. Um, uh, yeah, and I'd like to thank everyone again. If you have any questions at all about uh, this presentation or would like to follow up with any of our presenters, feel free to email us here at the email provided support at cloudstreet.info. Um, and uh, I think NASA, Radiant Earth, and Cloudistry are, are very busy in this next month with a ton of interesting talks related to this 
all the way from AI technology through to how do we actually tackle best kind of last point? How do we implement social science and, and marry it with Earth's observation data and really think about broader uh, techniques for impact evaluation? So all these topics and more will be discussed both this week at Understanding Risk um, and throughout the month during AGU. So please keep an eye out. Um, and also uh, just a plug that we are actively hiring at Kaja Street. So feel free to check out our website. Um, there are a bunch of roles from software engineer to impact evaluation and solutions engineer. So we're really looking out for some more talent to join our team. So we'd be happy to hear from you. All right. Thank you everyone for joining again and have a wonderful day.